afternoon and a very warm welcome to this EPC update, our regular look at the key developments in and around the European Union. My name is Jackie Davis. I'm a senior advisor to the EPC. And with me this week, as always, Fabian Zulig, Chief Executive and Chief Economist of the EPC, and Yanis Emanulidis, Deputy Chief Executive and Director of Studies. And we are particularly delighted to have with us our special guest today, Natalie Tocci, Director of the Instituto Affari Internazionali uh, and a member of the EPC's Governing Board, among many, many other things. Great to have you with us, Natalie. Thank you so much for being here. I know it's a hectic time at the moment. So today we're between EU summits. Our last uh, couple of updates have focused very much on discussions between EU leaders at summits. Today we're in between European councils, so we thought we would zoom out a bit, take more of a helicopter view and ask ourselves what are the prospects for EU integration in the new phase of the perma crisis sparked by recent developments in the Middle East? As always, totally interactive session. I have some questions for our panel. If you want to join in, either click on the raised hands button and I will unmute you when the time comes or write your question in the Q&A box. And as always, please, a plea for brevity if you are writing your question so I can see very quickly what it is you want to know and who you want to know it from. Uh, so let us jump straight in. And Natalie, I want to come to you first because we, Yanis, Fabian and I, reflected a little bit on the State of the Union in our post-summit briefing last month. So just to get a sense of you, from you, before we go into the developments in the Middle East, the geopolitical tensions and so on, in a broad sense, how do you see the current state of the Union uh, in a world where we see so much fragmentation, polarisation, conflict, and indeed pressures on our democratic principles? Um, how pessimistic or optimistic are you? Okay, Jackie, well, um, you know, listen, had we uh, met um, and had this meeting, I don't know, three, four, five months ago, there would have been, you know, a little bit of a ping pong here in which, you know, there would have been Fabian the pessimist and then there would have been, you know, Natalie the optimist and Yanis probably somewhere in between, right? Now that that moment has gone. Uh, and uh, I don't know if I can actually outmatch Fabian here, <laughs> but uh, but let me say that um, I'm, I'm extremely pessimistic at the moment. I, I can't recall a moment in which um, I have been this pessimistic about the state of affairs in, in Europe and, and, and around us. Um, and perhaps just to sort of start off with, um, and I'll be very brief here, but you know, why is it that I've changed my views so so radically? I really kind of had a sense uh, up until a few months ago that on a number of issues, we were, you know, we were not being fast enough. We were not doing as much as we should have done, but we were moving in the right direction. I've held this view on, for instance, issues such as climate and energy. Um, I have held these views on uh, Ukraine. I think on Ukraine, it's actually quite impressive how, you know, sort of almost two years on, here we are still standing united, reviving enlargement, um, you know, beginning to step and assume, you know, greater relative responsibility to the United States as far as um, economic and, of course, military support uh, as well. So, you know, obviously not enough, but moving in the right direction. The movie, I think, has changed really rather dramatically. And it's not that the Middle East has been the one and only uh, issue here. But I think, to me at least, the Middle East kind of really crystallized so many of the other things that have been going wrong. Um, you know, it had been going wrong in the Sahel, where, uh, you know, we were kind of fairly brutally kicked out. And okay, you know, things happen, things can go wrong. And yet here we are months into the coup epidemic in the region, and we don't even know what we want. You know, well, what's our vision for the Sahel? Well, what do we want? Well, no answer. Then, of course, you know, you move on to the Caucasus and there, you know, obviously we were unable not only to prevent war, but of course, ethnic cleansing uh, in the region, not out of a will in trying, you know, I actually think that, um, you know, the EU and in particular, uh, Council President Charles Michel has done a remarkable job, but we just don't have a lot of leverage, right? I mean, we have a tiny military, uh, a, a tiny uh, um, uh, uh, military monitoring uh, mission, um, 
neither Armenia nor Azerbaijan has the prospects of enlargement. I mean, basically, we don't have real leverage there. And then, of course, comes the Middle East, where the divisions have been, um, you know, sort of almost to the point, I mean, I don't, uh, yeah, just shocking. <laughs> um, we have spent more time bickering with each other than figuring out what is it that we should be doing. Um, I think, you know, to, 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 you know, to credit to the high representative, I think recently he has been trying to sort of move the conversation slightly forward, um, but in a sense, by not talking about what is happening now, you know, by focusing the discussion on the one hand on the humanitarian access, but on the other hand, on the day after. Well, frankly speaking, the day after will depend on where the war, you know, when and how Indeed. the war ends. Mm. And of course, because we're divided on that question, we kind of, you know, sort of skip it altogether. And so have a slightly magical conversation about days after, which totally kind of jars with, with reality and the way in which it's heading. Lots to come back to and what all this means in a moment. But Fabian, your reputation precedes you. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Sometimes Mr. Glum on EPC updates, sometimes a little more. Only positive. sometimes. Only are sometimes. you, uh, uh, Fabian, are you able to find any glimmers of hope in the current state of the union? Or like Natalie, do you find yourself, uh, she said she can't remember ever being so pessimistic. Is that where you are as well? I mean, I think uh, what the current situation unfortunately shows is that it is not um, individual actions or people, it is not particular policy positions, but that we are having structural problems in how we react to these kind of situations, how we react uh, to a much more uh, geopolitically, geoeconomically challenging world uh, in which we're in. And that was already the case before uh, what happened uh, in, in Gaza uh, and in Israel, but uh, it is even more obvious now. So no, I don't think there's a lot uh, of hope in that. Uh, I wish uh, I could uh, say that uh, I see it very differently. Um, I think the only... Um, glimmer of hope might be that maybe finally we will now face the situation as it is, not as we want it to be, um, because up to now uh, the European Union um, and its member states, so this is not about the institutions, this is about the whole political um, system, um, have not been able to um, be honest uh, with themselves and uh, with the citizens about the very challenging situation we're in. Um, I've just been to Morocco um, speaking at a conference and it is, um, to, to use Natalie's word, shocking when you hear how Europe is being perceived now uh, and that we have to recognize that what we can achieve in the world is rather more limited, but that doesn't mean we can stop doing it because this geopolitical environment is not going to go away. If anything, it's going to get more challenging. Um, and just to put one marker down, uh, we have this hugely polarized uncertainty about what kind of president we're going to have in the White House mm. after the next election, um, which could make it even more challenging. I mean, this is uh, under the current president, who's probably the most pro-European president we will see in our lifetime, uh, it's already very difficult. Um, let's not uh, hopefully see what happens when we have Trump too or someone else of the same ilk. Thank you. Yanis, uh, uh, complete the picture in terms of where we stand, and then we will delve into um, some of the specifics that you've raised, but also what do we do about it? I'll try at the end to be a bit more positive. Um, but um, I know that politics is not math. But if I add uh, what uh, Natalie was saying with respect to the Mideast Sahel um, Caucasus, um, to my appreciation of us not actually living up to the watershed moment we experienced because, uh, following the um, war in Ukraine, because I think if you scratched just a bit, you could see the disunity among the EU27 um, and that we were actually in view of the dramatic potential challenges and uncertainties related to 
the Zeitenwende, the global Zeitenwende, I think we should know the talk, I say, um, that you could see how many differences there were among the 27. And I think, and I was thinking for a long time that there is a danger that in some years time we will be asking ourselves, why we did we do much more in order to prepare ourselves for the consequences of what we were seeing at the Eastern flank of the, of the European Union. So if I now add what uh, the starting point of Natalie, I think the, the picture is extremely bleak. Uh, and what we have been talking about in terms of, you know, the ambition, unity, dilemma, progress, illusion, just to just some of the terms we have been all using and um, some of us have been using. Um, I think one cannot be very positive. Having said all that, um, I think if you go back to the watershed, the glo global site, and then the, I can see that there now. I think it took us too long, but uh, after more than one and a half years after the invasion of Ukraine, at least I sense that there is more of an awareness of the fundamental consequences. We're having a debate about enlargement. We're having it about, about EU reform. I'm not saying it will lead to what it should be leading towards, but we see that there is a certain momentum. Um, by the way, also on the positive side, I would say the outcome of the Polish elections, because you also were referring to uh, the state of democracy in Europe, I think, was extremely good news, which I think still being un undervalued by many. Um, yeah. And then the point which uh, Fabian made uh, with respect to Trump or Trump two, uh, which will probably be much worse than Trump one. God forbid that it will become reality. I'm knock on woods. Um, you don't see it. Um, but I think there are so many wake up calls out there um, that I think and I hope that we will still respond so I try to be not as negative um, as Natalie and Fabian, but I understand there are a lot of reasons to be negative. Um, but I think um, it's not the time to give up because we have the normative responsibility to try to push things in a, in a better direction, although it's difficult, I, I must admit, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and we'll come back on what waking up would look like. But Natalie, before we do that, I want to come back to what Ursula von der Leyen said in her State of the Union speech just two months ago, when she said, and I quote, we have seen the birth of a geopolitical union. Uh, now you have said in a number of articles that you've written recently, well, one in one you said that Ukraine showed the promise of what could happen, what it might mean. But then you've talked about it being the Middle East being its demise, it evaporating before our eyes. I mean, I just wonder, I understand what you're saying about how you feel we're going in the wrong direction, but that's quite apocalyptic in terms of where we were to where we have come in such a short space of time. And the Middle East has always been an issue that has taxed and stretched people to their limits. So is it really as bad as, as you as you paint, or is this a particular issue which always causes these sorts of difficulties for countries across the world? Well, tell you why I think um, it is different now, and it actually doesn't have to do with the Middle East itself. Uh, it has to do with the rest of the world. Um, so in a sense, you know, we used to live in a world in which we were, and you know, as, as far as the, the overall global picture is concerned, on a question like the Middle East, we've always been in a minority, right? But yeah, it didn't really matter. Yes, it was kind of unprincipled. And, you know, if one had an enlightened idea of what interests are all about, it was maybe even against our interests. But, you know, um, the fact that we were in, in the global minority, in a sense, was kind of neither here nor there. Now it matters, yeah? Now the, you know, so the people don't like talking about it in terms of the global South, although the global South likes talking about it in terms of the global South. Uh, but anyway, that takes us in a different sort of direction. Um, but at the very least, the power South, yeah? I mean, the, the, the multi-aligns, the mid-powers that want to be great. I mean, all of this matters, right? Um, so it's not just quote unquote about the relationship. I mean, if you want to be geopolitical, yeah, yes, it's about the relationship with the United States. And here, as we were saying, hey, you know, sort of clouds on the horizon. It is about obviously the relationship with China, but it's also about the relationship with the Saudis and the Indians and the Emiratis and, and the Brazils. And, and in what way is what is happening in the Middle East, or rather how we are behaving in the Middle East, putting us in a stronger position to deal with that rest of the world. You know, in the case of Ukraine, 
we woke up to the harsh reality that not everyone agrees with us. Not everyone wanted to play along with sanctions and all the rest of it or support Ukraine, but we were with the global majority. We were with 141 strong majority in the UN General Assembly. Um, you know, we were on the side of right, basically. Now we are in the minority. We don't have a leg to stand on from literally whatever angle you look at it. And, you know, whereas we could, um, you know, sort of rightfully argue against the whataboutism at mm. the beginning of the Ukraine war, the what about Iraq and Syria and Yemen and all the rest of it, very difficult to argue now that you have this comparison being made, which paradoxically we ourselves started making between Ukraine and, and, and Israel. Because in a sense, if we were about, if we, if we, the positions that we took were positions based on universe and the universal values, right, that we preach, if there really should have been a comparison, it should have been about the two occupied territories. Um, the fact that we deliberately made a comparison between Israel and uh, and Ukraine was all about, this is not about universal norms. This is about the West. Mm. Well, frankly speaking, if we couch it in those terms, we not only fall in the minority, but in a minority that is fast shrinking. So and, there's nothing geopolitical basically about that whatsoever. And just to follow up on that, in one of your articles recently, you said when you talked about uh, the geopolitical union evaporated for hours, you said, some people might ask, so what? You've said, now this matters. Beyond the fact that we are in a minority, beyond the, what you've just described, why does this matter so much for us as a continent, as well as for our place in the world? Well, I mean, it matters to the extent that we know that we cannot get, um, you know, even when we have our debates about autonomy and all the rest of it, we never and we never have meant autonomy in terms of autarky. We have it ingrained in our DNA that the things that we want to achieve in this world, be it on climate, on energy, on digital, on the economy, on peace and security, on you, you name it, we know that we have to work with others. Yeah. So that is sort of fundamentally built into our DNA. And frankly speaking, it's common sense, right? Now, if we have to work with others, we have to be considered as credible interlocutors by others. Mm -hmm. And I think the way in which we have been positioning ourselves on the Middle East has dramatically diminished our already dubious credibility in much of the world. Mm -hmm. So our claims, Fabian, at leadership on big issues, many across a range of areas, are undermined by this. Would you share uh, Natalie's analysis of why it matters, the answer to that so what question? Um, well, uh, just to keep with my usual outlook, I, I think uh, it's even worse than that, because it matters on so many different fronts. It matters for Ukraine. It matters that it will be far more difficult for uh, the European Union uh, to be able to continue to rely at least on a majority of countries around the world. Um, in fact, it is an invitation for others to use Ukraine as a bargaining chip uh, when it comes uh, to relations with Europe. It matters because uh, we know the US is a deeply divided country. Um, and we are now seen as even more inextricably linked to the US. So if things change in the US to the worst from a European perspective, we have nowhere to go. Um, we are now uh, inextricably linked, um, which also means that in the relationship with the US, we have no bargaining power um, because the US can simply dictate the terms. It matters because on issues such as climate change, where you are going to have to find some form of consensus with the global south, and I also don't like the term, but it's being used by uh, the countries themselves. What is our offer on issues such as climate change? How are we going to convince anyone that we, we can construct a global consensus uh, when on issues which are extremely emotive, Europe is seen to be, by many of these countries, of being on the wrong side. Mm. And that is not to say that, uh, of course, there are things which we should have done, which were right. Um, uh, 
but the way we have done them the lack of um any consideration of how we have also interacted with others in that process uh, the lack of reflection the lack of seeing also the differences to the us on some issues uh, one of the things which um which others have pointed out is that at times it seemed that the european union was going further and that the us was then uh, rowing back, um, leaving the European Union completely stranded, uh, because they had gone even further than what the US was saying. So, I mean, these are the the kind of things which uh, are deeply damaging. Um, and as Natalie was saying, we weren't in a good position beforehand, uh, but we are now in a much worse position. Um, and this will have consequences. And so what? Why does it matter? because the challenges aren't going to go away they are the geopolitical challenges which we are facing um so what has gone away is our ability to deal with them but not the challenges themselves absolutely yanis um the same question to you about so what but also can i just pick up fabian's that talked about ukraine because he said you know it matters for ukraine because the european union cannot uh necessarily won't be able to rely on that majority around the world but it also matters for ukraine because of the risk uh, of, that it saps energy, it saps attention away from. And that achievement that Natalie was talking about, that impressive degree of unity that she was referring to, that vision that the EU managed to show and stick to at a strategy for delivering. How do we make sure that this doesn't undermine that at the same time within the European Union? Well, first of all, on the so what question, I think as a starting point, I'm asking myself, how can we even ask the question, so what? in a world which is dramatically changing in front of our eyes, in, in a world which is so volatile, in a world in which, uh, you know, whether you call it uh, multipolar, pluripolar, or whatever you want to call it, in a world where uh, the so-called global south will, to a large extent, also determine the way it is positioning itself of how in the, the world of tomorrow will look like in terms of the power relationship, especially among the then global powers. Um, to ask, so what does it matter? I think is extremely naive you know? because there's a price to pay if you're not able to speak with one voice. Uh, sounds like a cliche, but there's a price to pay. And there's a price to pay if you cannot agree um, on a joint position. And there's a price to pay if you're not if you're credible, to use the word which you were using, Natalie. Um, so, and that price is huge. And by the way, it will probably be even bigger not for us, but for future generations who will probably have to pay a price for the fact uh, that we're not taking, uh, that, that we're not being taken credible. Um, and, but sooner than that, we already were talking about Trump too, which now everyone's fearing. Um, and I wonder myself, why are we now, uh, why are some people now getting up and fearing that Trump too might become a reality? Uh, we should, you know, have prepared for the eventuality of potentially something of that kind happening, a change in the White House, even if it would not have been Trump. Uh, what we So, so for me, the so what question is not actually, the, it really, really matters. Um, mm -hmm. And by the way, um, also in terms of how we treat the countries of uh, the so-called global south, um, mm -hmm. we don't like the term, but they use it, uh, but uh, that we still do moral preaching. I still have the impression that uh, if you talk to also decision makers throughout Europe, I sometimes have the sense that they that there's a belief that we have a moral high ground. Whereas we should be looking into the mirror and asking ourselves, where do we get it wrong? Yeah. What were the yeah. mistakes we have committed instead of, you know, telling others what they should be doing. Um, but we still pretend that we are on a more high ground, which seen from the outside is obviously not the case. And I think we need to take the position which outsiders, non-Europeans have extremely, extremely um, importantly um, and realize that the criticism which they're bringing towards us is something which actually it does matter mm. it matters and for on, our future on the, on the spillover of this from this into the ukraine situation well i think we had already been seeing before the october 7th that there was uh less there was a tiredness with the war in ukraine um that was not as not is not being said publicly well some uh, say it uh, in public without, no. Uh, why is now Natalie laughing? Um, but um, there was a sense 
of, of, well, we need to move on, we need to find the solutions, we need to put more pressure on the Ukrainians. Um, so there is a link, obviously, between the two. And by the way, there is also, if you have these mega conflicts, um, they are always linked with each other. So what happens in the Middle East has an effect on Ukraine and vice versa. Uh, so you cannot avoid these linkages. But on the other hand, um, I think there is a, still a strong appreciation among the U27 that we need to continue to show the unity we have been showing. Again, if you dig a bit deeper, you will see how much disunity is there is among the U27. But when you're, for example, talking about adapting uh, the multi-annual financial framework to have more money at the disposal of the EU in order to support Ukraine, I don't see that that is endangered. Um, but there is a link. And I, and you can also see that there are worries in Kiev when it comes to this, and I can understand why they are worried. So, Natalie, from your perspective, what can we do? Can the EU do anything now at this stage to repair the damage done to its reputation uh, by the initial response to October the 7th to what has happened since then? Uh, and a word also from you on this issue of Ukraine and the risk of contagion, if I can put it that way. Um, so the first one, of course, is is the, I mean, nothing in life is irreversible, but this is as close as it gets, <laughs> frankly speaking. Um, so, you know, does it mean that therefore we may, you know, we got it wrong, we may as well persevere in, in error? Well, obviously not. Um, I think in order to change our position on the Middle East, um, what we should be doing is, and what by we, I'm actually mainly talking about the political level, because perhaps this is another observation to add. This has been an issue which has been traditionally divisive, and it has traditionally seen a divide between public opinions and governments. Nothing new, frankly speaking. What is new now, and I think this is, in my memory, I have not, I, I do not recall something like this, you have a palpable divide between institutions and their political masters, right? Um, it is not just, you know, the letter being sent by commission officials to the commission president. It is also the divide between, I mean, now, you know, sort of Macron has uh, somewhat changed his position, but there was tension mounting from the Quai d'Orsay onto the Elysee. Um, less explicit, but very palpable indeed, once you start having the conversations, the same can be said within the German foreign ministry uh, and, again, the positions of Schultz and his government. Um, same here in Rome, very clear divide between the foreign ministry and the prime minister's office. So this is about institutions that, you know, are there to serve, you know, of course, norms, but the interest, basically, uh, of their, uh, uh, you know, of their leaders of their state of the European Union, that are basically saying we are shooting ourselves in the foot. Mm. And, and so at the very least, I think, you know, how is it that we can reverse this? I don't know, but how is it that we can, you know, why is it these messages are not getting through? Why is it that governments, not all of them, but I would say probably about 25 out of 27, maybe 24, if I, you know, were to be very generous, but 24 out of 27 are somewhat detached from from where their institutions are, are taking them. Isn't that partly, what? Natalie, sorry to interrupt, but isn't that partly simply politicians hate to be seen to be changing course? So they find it very hard to say, hmm, maybe we need to rethink this. Well, you know, if, if I were actually to put put it down to one factor, uh, I think it's down to one 81-year-old man. Uh, I think that if an 81-year-old man on the other side of the Atlantic were at some point to say enough is enough, those 25 member states would which, change their which position overnight. Which brings us back to the question about, you know, um, what, what Fabian was saying about, you know, we don't have any bargaining power with the US uh, and we're in trouble if there's a change of, of administration. And Jan is saying we should be preparing for that potential change of administration. I mean, how concerned are you that, that Europe... Uh, is also not only um, getting its response wrong in the Middle East, as you see it, but also creating 
further problems down the line when we see what unfolds in America next year. Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that we're not um, we're, we're not really doing anything to Trump proof Europe. Um, you know, we we are perhaps beginning. So, okay, well, what does it? What does Trump proofing Europe actually mean? So, That's I think there's I a there, there's there's a democracy conversation here, and I'm not sure. You know, sort of, and, and indeed, I think the Poland question is absolutely key, key. So, in this respect, you could say, well, you know, if one in Europe, if we get the policy bit right, the politics doesn't automatically fit into place. But that's, you know, as good a, a, a chance as we will get to make sure that we don't go, go down that that route. But it's very difficult, as we know by definition, to to control. Are we Trump proofing Europe on Ukraine? I think, you know, if if I were to point to one one issue which would literally change overnight in US foreign policy, it is Ukraine. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, it is true that, you know, we're obviously in a better place today than the, we were two years ago. But in, if in the years from now, the US were to stop providing military assistance to Ukraine, and I think that's a plausible scenario where the Trump come back, we would be totally screwed. I'm mm. sorry for the, the very diplomatic language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like totally, totally. Um, and then there is where the is is where the sort of war fatigue um sort of debate blurs into magical again thinking of basically saying, well, okay, maybe as a result of this, there can be a negotiation. Like totally dismissing the fact that it, it kind of takes two to have a negotiation, right? <laughs> and there is one at the very least that, you know, maybe we have leverage on the other, meaning the Ukrainians, question mark, but let's say for the sake of argument that we can force Zelensky to the negotiation table, he would be alone, right? Because there'd be no one on the other side. Yeah. And, 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 and this is where the whole war fatigue debate becomes very odd, because whereas the U U.S., can pull back. I mean, I think it would be against fundamentally U.S. interests, but the U.S. can pull back from Ukraine. And, you know, it will be only marginally consequential on the U.S. itself. We can't pull back. I mean, this is in Europe, right? Yeah. And and so this is where the Trump proofing. So on the Middle East, I think it's a slightly different situation in the sense that I think in the Middle East, um, Trump would not do something tragically, would not do something that is radically different from what Biden has been doing. I mean, you know, let's face it, Biden on the Middle East has been Trump light. It has been normalization agreements over the heads of the Palestinians, um, no ceasefire, bear hugging. Okay. So, yeah. you know, I I'm not sure that the Middle East would be a, a, a massive switch. I think the Middle East, though, is relevant because what we're doing now on the Middle East is uh, or may well be um, increasing rather significantly the chances of a Trump comeback. Okay. Let me ask Yanis and Fabian, and Yanis, this time I'll come to you first. Um, how do we Trump-proof Europe, to put it the way Natalie uh, framed it? First of all, I think by understanding what Natalie was telling us, by understanding what is actually at stake for us, and the stakes for us are enormous. Um, and I still feel that although I said in the beginning there's a better understanding of what potential consequences of what happening in, in Ukraine um, are for the EU, I still think we are not realizing the full extent of what it potentially could matter uh, could mean. And unfortunately, uh, because not that you were saying in a year's time, a year's time when it comes to security and defense is nothing. Yeah, it's tomorrow. Yeah, it's actually less than tomorrow. Um, so when some of us were saying some years ago, let's prepare ourselves and preparing means at the EU level, meaning in terms of cooperation among us, but also at the national level. I think that these voices were not heard. Right? Also, if you look into what's happening at the national level, if you take Germany as an example, um, you know, compared to what ha Schultz had announced in terms of what has actually happened in terms of the Bundeswehr being now more prepared uh, than it had been two years ago, that is not the case. Uh, so it's not only at the European level that we're not delivering when it comes to you to 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 making ourselves uh, ready for a moment in which uh, potentially uh, someone like Trump enters office. Um, there's so much to do and so little time. And by the way, 
you know, if you listen to uh, what Trump in this case was talking when he was talking about in the in the in the in the internal national context, he was calling his political enemies ferments. Uh, that just shows you that he will seek revenge. Mm? Yeah. And and that means he will also seek revenge beyond the borders of the US. Um, and obviously Ukraine is the case where he can be the toughest on us. Um, and we will be standing there and saying, oh, shit, we didn't expect that. Uh, this is where you can then really get not only annoyed, but more than that. Fabian. What can we do? It's, uh, it's the big question. Um, I mean, I think firstly, and that was already in, in what we were talking about, is maybe the starting point is to start to have this strategic debate across borders. And we said it many times in the update as well, this is not happening. There is no conversation happening which talks about what is it we're actually trying to achieve? Where are we going to go? Uh, who uh, is going to be uh, in the leadership position? And I think that's the second point. I think what we have to also address is the political economy of all of this. Um, so when you talk in private to decision makers, uh, broadly speaking, uh, you get two responses. You get the either the ignorance, everything is fine. Uh, yeah, these kind of things happen, but over time it will turn out okay. Or you get the response, which in many ways is even more worrying, that they tell you, yeah, we know all of this is really serious. It's really important, but we can't do anything because politics doesn't allow us to yeah. do it. Um, and I think we are going to have to start having a different political conversation uh, to say, how can we make sure that our democracies can still produce the right kind of outcomes uh, to deal with the challenges which we have, because they are not at the moment. And the third point is we have to walk the walk. We have to start doing the kind of things which we have talked about. Um, and even when it comes to things which are under our control, a lot of the things we've been talking about are not under our control. They are happening somewhere else. But there are things which are under our control. But even in those areas, the debate we're having is uh, rather uh, disappointing. And that's the nicest word I can find. What, what if, if we are already looking at you know, the multi-annual financial framework, where's the recognition that the world has radically changed, that we are not talking about just a marginal uh, discussion? When we look at the European defense sector, where is the 10-year plan which says how are we going to produce what we are going to need for ourselves and for Ukraine? Mm. When it comes to the question of enlargement, where are the reforms which we know we are going to have to make to make this serious? And uh, this is, you know, I could keep going with this list. So even in those areas which are fully under our control, we are not doing what we said. Okay. We I want to come back on that list in a moment and ask you to, to identify some priorities within that. Just to read out, I think it's more of a comment than a question, but it very much links into what we're discussing. Philippe hamro Drutz in our audience says, as regards the EU's possibility to have a say in global circumstances, including in Ukraine, in Gaza today, the first challenge, says Philippe, is to make the utmost to strengthen the internal homogeneity among EU members, which is de facto its core weakness. Um, we must confirm that's the way we would confirm to our partners the EU's role as a credible glo global bet. It is up to ourselves, he says. He says, would it be possible? I want to reframe it in a moment into concretely what do we need to do? Um, but uh, let me take also a question from John Palmer. John, I have unmuted you. John, are you there? Not at the moment. I will come back just before we move on to that strategic agenda for the future. Um, Natalie, just a thought um, comments that both um, Fabian and Yanis made about the global south and about the difference between how the EU perceives itself and how the rest of the world perceives it at times. Um, what does the EU need to do to respond well, to those perceptions, which are so different from how we like to see ourselves? Um. Well, I mean, I think several things. Um, well, firstly, it should listen more, <laughs> right? And so I think uh, there is 
Um, and to be honest, I think that, you know, the, the Ukraine wake up call uh, had 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 kind of ignited that conversation. I mean, you know, there was a growing recognition that we should listen more, not, not only listen more to what they think about us, but listen more to what other countries want and build relationships kind of on, on that basis. So, you know, I think intellectually, I mean, and perhaps to an extent politically, I think it still hadn't filtered down into actual policy initiatives, but I think there was this kind of growing recognition that, that something should be done. Um, I think the difficulty that, that we have um, at the moment is, and may sound a little bit odd what I'm, what I'm about to say, but just to sort of follow me in the reasoning, actually has less to do with the means and more to do with the goals. What I mean by this is that, let's say you take um, China as a global player mm. and you ask yourself, you know, is China influential in the world? And, you know, probably no one in this room will say no, right? We all say, yes, of course, China is influential. Now, what does this influence actually translate in? Does China... Um, is it influential in the sense of kind of, you know, wanting regimes to look like itself? I mean, is it into the business of uh, uh, the promotion of know, authoritarianism? No. I mean, it doesn't have that level of ambition, right? So we consider it to be influential because it has certain goals um, that may be more limited in nature, less ambitious, we would define them, right? Uh, and it actually achieves them. Now, of course, it's easy to track influence if it goes upwards, right? I mean, if your level of ambition gradually, as your means develop, your level of ambition grows. It's somewhat more complicated to do so if your level of ambition has to be scaled back down, right? Uh, and become more commensurate to the fact that you've got relatively less power in the world. So I appreciate the complication, but we still, and this is, you know, this is not a, a conversation that started yesterday. I mean, I would say that it's at the very least a decade that we've been having this conversation about, ah, but we know we can't just do values and we've got to become more, you know, sort of, it's more, it has to be more about the interest and we've got to scale down that transformational agenda. But does that then mean kind of, you know, getting values completely out from the agenda? So we're still there intellectually, right? I mean, we haven't actually sort of, we, we haven't had a goals discussion beyond enlargement, I should say, but enlargement, of course, is an area mm -hmm. where the instruments still um, enable you to have very high ambitious goals, right? But we haven't, but beyond enlargement, we haven't actually had that conversation, which I think also explains why in many parts of the world, it's not that we're not achieving things. We don't even know what we want to achieve. And this is why I gave the Sahel example. Mm. So I think there's a goals, in a sense, conversation to be had, which even sort of has to pre, you know, sort of preempt or so, you know, pre predate the means conversation, which is kind of complicated as it is. Indeed. And I want to now move on to that conversation because very much they're echoing what Fabian was saying about we have to have that strategic debate across borders. Where do we want to go? We don't know, you're saying, what we need to achieve. So um, and I want to link this to a question from Luca Barbaris in our audience, who says, clearly, the panel agrees a stronger geopolitical presence and influence is needed to become a more adequate player in protecting our interests and contributing to global governance, according to EU values. Crucially, says Luca, what actions are needed to allow this to happen? Is it more funding, competence, cooperation at EU level, stronger foreign policies? And he says from individual member states. I suppose let's encapsulate this. We are looking to European elections. We are looking to a new legislative cycle, a new commission. In terms of that strategic agenda for the next legislative cycle, where do we need to focus? What should the priorities be? Um, and I'm, I'm taking on board what you're saying about, well, we haven't had the conversation about what we want to achieve. So can we have the conversation? But within your sense of where the EU should be aiming, what needs to be on that strategic agenda to enable us to be a player? Let me come, Fabian, first to you. You raised the issue of the strategic debate. What you mentioned already a number of issues. If we're focusing and down to our core priorities, what would you say are most important? I, I'm not going to help you, Jackie, because I don't think we can focus it down to just a number of key issues. I think that's an illusion because, and, and this is also my response um, to the question on 
foreign policy? Do we need more resources, competences, etc.? Yes, all of that. But all of that is not enough. What we actually need is a much more coherence in our thinking and in our action across all policy areas. So if we are talking about foreign policy, you know, for example, one of the issues which has hardly been mentioned at the European level at all is agriculture. Uh, we have to reform our agricultural system with a view towards enlargement uh, to Ukraine, but also with a view to the global south, uh, to what impact all this war has on food security around the globe. We have to have that discussion. We have to have a discussion around migration. A lot of our relationship uh, with our neighbors is actually dominated by migration rather than anything else. Uh, we have to have the discussions around, across all of the different policy areas. And that's when we can actually create a credible foreign policy because it will have a backbone, it will have a reality. Um, so for me, this is about having that strategic discussion and saying, what are the realistic goals we have? And in that, we also have to stop uh, ignoring that there are trade-offs, uh, that we cannot do everything at the same time. Something will have to give in all of this. We cannot have investment into everything. We don't have the money to do that. We cannot have this pretense uh, that we can continue with uh, the rather comfortable position we were in. If we are talking about foreign policy, one of the key questions is what are we doing in terms of hard security? Because up to now, we've relied on the American shield. Um, uh, what are we going to do? Because even in the best possible circumstances, the US is no longer willing to just accept that Europe free rides on the security provision from the US. So even if we don't get Trump too, it's a question we have to answer. And you could continue this, but this is a debate we have to have at the strategic level. But then we also have to talk to populations and we have to say to populations this is a different world and it's going to hurt but if we are not going to do that if we are not making the sacrifices which are needed and i'm using these terms because i know they are emotive but i think it's important if we are not making the sacrifices we are leaving a complete mess to the next generation Thank you. Um, Yanis, it occurs to me, listening to, to what Natalie and, and Fabian have, have been saying about our direction, so on, the EU is tending to frame the debate about reform of itself uh, in terms of being ready for enlargement. We do we need, you know, are we going to be ready when the time comes? Is that perhaps obscuring some of these fundamental questions uh, that we're now asking in this discussion about direction, about trade offs, and so on? I.e., it's boiling it down and making it too simplistic. It's simply a sort of mechanical institutional reforms to be able to take decisions more easily, et cetera. Is it, is it reducing the discussion? Uh, and if it is, how do we come out of that? And would you agree with this plea for a much broader strategic debate first? Well, first of all, I think when it comes to what we call the geopolitical imperative, that relates to both enlargement and to EU reform. So we need to reform ourselves because we are living in the world we're living, what we were discussing earlier. But we also need to reform ourselves because of enlargement and prepare ourselves for enlargement. Uh, I would put it under the heading of geopolitical, both of it. Um, but I want to go back to the politics of this, um, because Natalie, when you were explaining what the situation looks like and also the differences within the member states uh, between institutions, but also in the debate, in the public debate, where you have very different positions being represented. Um, but actually, I feel that we still at the national level are not having an honest debate. And if we don't have an honest debate at the national level about what actually potentially might happen, and if you talk to that with policymakers, with those who will be do, campaigning uh, in the next year's European Parliament elections, you say, we need, I say, we need, you need brutal honesty in the debate. Um, what I hear often is, well, this is something we cannot do because the citizens won't be able to bear that brutal honesty. I think that's naive. One, because citizens already feel, maybe not in every detail, of, of what potentially the consequences are of inertia. 
by the way, at all levels of policymaking, yeah, national and European um, and global, um, that what the consequences of inertia are. People are aware of that, but we're actually hiding away from these debates. Um, and if you then, if you have that situation at the national level, and by the way, you're also combined with often very weak governments, minority governments, complex uh, coalition governments, parties which are much more under pressure than they were 10 or 20 years ago, um, we know all the systemic changes which you're also seeing at the national level, that's all bad news also for the European level. You know? So even if we reform ourselves in terms of the, the need to reform our policies, in terms of the need uh, to think of how we will reform our governance and institutional structures, also what kind of budget we will need in future, if the politics of all that doesn't work, you know, first, we will probably not get the reforms we need, uh, again, not because of enlargement, but because of the, the other, the geopolitical imperative put into the need on us to, uh, to reform ourselves. But also, even if you would have these reforms, it is questionable if the politics are such as what we just described, whether the thing would work. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't try. No, I'm just saying it's much more complex than thinking that it is a me mechanical exercise where you tweak it here and there. You, know, you have QMV and the world's nice. That's not how it works. Mm. Natalie, your reaction on this, and, and I want to link it back also to what you talked about was those tensions within, you were talking about within ministries, uh, within government. Um, and there Yanis talking about, you know, not having that honest debate and Fabian referring to that lack of an honest discussion that this is about trade-offs, difficult decisions, sacrifices was the word he uses. Do you think, Natalie, that we need to reframe this debate? Uh, and if we do, um, how can we do it in a way that uh, brings the public along, engages with them, engages with them honestly, but also brings them along and doesn't make them, if you like, say, well, I don't like what I'm hearing. I'm going to turn to someone who tells me what I do want to hear, which is where we get our populist governments from. And I wonder, maybe you could say two words uh, about the country you know best in this discussion since the advent of the Maloney government. Yeah. So, well, firstly, I mean, I think, um, you know, sort of one thing about what what is likely to happen and another about what is not going to happen. And, and I'm actually going to echo much of what both Fabian and Yanis were, were saying. So, you know, I think that what will happen, I mean, you know, obviously depending exactly how the elections turn out, but, you know, you could well imagine uh, a new political institutional cycle that says, hey, you know, here we are, we have four main priorities. We're going to do enlargement, we're going to do the bare minimum reforms necessary to make enlargement happen. We're going to do industrial policy and tech, and that, you know, kind of um, is a right, slightly more conservative right-wing spin on carrying on the Green Deal. This is how it's going to be couched. And, you know, of course, there's the defense piece of it, where probably it really, you know, sort of how much emphasis this is going to get is going to probably depend on two factors, both of which are external to the EU. The first is, of course, as we were saying, what happens in the US. And the second is what happens in the war in Ukraine. Yeah, because I think, you know, to a large extent, the reason why the defense item vendor hasn't actually happened is that a creeping sense of complacency uh, has taken place, right? Where, you know, basically it's the sort of, okay, fine, you know, we don't really need Ukraine to win. It's been actually fairly amazing that Ukraine has not lost. Um, somehow assuming that this can be a war that can end in a fudge rather than a war that is still ongoing and that eventually will lead to someone winning and someone losing. If things were to change for the worse, and I fear that this is the trajectory of, that we're on, even if we maintain the current levels of support, then I think we would start getting nervous once again. So maybe, maybe, you know, sort of that is what is necessary um, to in a sense, you know, sort of have have that real click, yeah, in, in terms of defense. So anyway, this is, I think, you know, those four things, I think, you know, how effective it's going to be is, of course, an open question, but you can imagine something like this happening. But I think Fabian and Yanis were absolutely right. Well, first on Yanis, does this mean that we're actually addressing the reform question and framing it as we should? No, absolutely not. I mean, it's deliberately framed as the minimum necessary in order to make enlargement happen, as if that is the only reason why this is this is happening. And then to, to Fabian's point, I mean, this basically means completely chucking out the entire sustainability agenda, you know, 
with the exception of the bit that is connected to industrial policy and you know growth and all the rest of it we and out with that sustainability agenda is out with agriculture reform and then i think you know the other elephant in the room that he was pointing to was the discussion about public finances and eu and the eu budget yeah so do we have i mean do we sense a political configuration that is even beginning to and look i don't think that the problem is oh well we can't talk about it because of public opinion um you know sort of the, the point is that, that we're not even there yet they're not even attempting to make the case to public opinion and getting some pushback right yeah. i mean they're not even trying <laughs> um so uh, you know as yanis was saying if you don't even try um and you know how do you frame this to public opinion i think you frame it in terms of the costs of not doing this um, so there isn't, again, you know, back to magical thinking, there isn't a magical world in which you can carry on as is and not face any consequences. It's either the costs of acting, costly indeed, mm. or the costs of not acting, yeah. even more costly. Until it's framed in those terms, whether it's in security terms, in enlargement terms, in public finance terms, in sustainability terms, we will never have that honest conversation with, with public opinion. Thank you. Fabian, you wanted to jump in and then Yanis. Yeah, I mean, just to reinforce some of the points. I, I mean, firstly, I think in terms of public opinion, we missed a chance because right after the invasion, there was um, a recognition in a lot of parts of Europe, uh, in populations, that this is an exceptional moment, that this will require sacrifices, that this will... Uh, be something we have to do, uh, something far more radical than in the past. Uh, and essentially, it was uh, the recognition that this is a war which also involves us. Um, but we missed that chance because our governments told people, don't worry, it'll be fine. We'll deal with it. You don't have to worry. We'll deal with all the consequences. It's not your war. It's Ukraine's war and we'll support them, but it's not your war. And I think that has to be the starting point. We have to go back to say to people, no, this is your war because the consequences of losing it is the consequence for us of losing it. So that's, I, I think, on, on that. Um, I think the other problem I have with Natalie, and I think she's right, but the problem is if we get to the point where... Ukraine starts to lose ground where it's very clear that more needs to be done. It is far more difficult to counteract that at that moment in time, especially since all of the hard security stuff just takes enormous amounts of time. It's not that we have all this sitting. We have pretty much given everything we could. I mean, yes, there are still some, some bits, but overall, it's not that we're sitting on a huge amount of material we can give to Ukraine. Um, and then we have the added complication that things are getting more difficult with the US. So even in that situation, where is it going to come from if we haven't started to prepare? Um, and this is for me, um, whether we have a year or whether we have five years, we should be starting to talk about how do we do this. And and just wanted to come back to you as well on this question. I asked Yanis and both he and, and uh, Natalie have referred to it, whether framing this discussion within the EU around enlargement and really making that link, saying these are the things we need to do just to prepare for enlargement and, and reducing it to that uh, has, again, been a mistake and will be hard to get the conversation you want us to have because of the way it's being framed as a solely linked to the enlargement debate. Yeah. I mean, I'll get to that in just one second, but I just wanted to also say, Sorry. Yeah. I think when it comes to the politics of this, what I find astonishing is that leaders still think that it's actually better not to tell the truth to populations, because the reactions we're seeing from populations is that they're ready to hear the truth. But if they don't get told the truth, then they rather go with the alternatives who are telling them something different anyway. Mm. So I don't think this is a very good political strategy. It doesn't work. Uh, you have to be, I think, more honest. And we've seen, at least during COVID, uh, we've seen that actually some leaders globally, often women, manage to be credible 
they had very, very difficult messages for their populations, but they were credible in bringing them across. And I think that's a much better strategy. And just um, on that framing. Yeah, on, on the, the reform debate, yes. I mean, I, I think we should also not forget is why do we say that enlargement needs reforms? It's not for reform's sake. It is actually because we're saying it will get even more difficult, for example, to take decisions within the European Union. So we need the reform so that we can actually act when it comes to these situations. So it's not uh, for its own sake, it is because the European Union is not effective. And if we cannot do the kind of things which we need to do within the framework of the European Union system, well, then we have to do it outside of it. But we cannot simply give the answer that, well, it's not possible. Yeah. Uh, if we look at something like qualified majority voting, if we have to make a decision, then we have to make a decision. And if that isn't possible within the framework of the European method or within the institution, then we have to do it outside. But the answer at the moment is, oh, well, let's rather not talk about this decision because it might create disunity. And that's exactly what we were trying to highlight uh, with the unity ambition dilemma that ultimately what we just end up with is much lower ambition. Uh, we just don't do the things which need to be done. Yeah, there's a reference there to a paper that both Fabian and Yanis wrote a little while ago about the unity ambition yeah. dilemma. Do take a look if you haven't read it, and Yanis. I, I actually, uh, sorry, can I just do, yeah. just very quickly? And I, you know, I, actually, I think in this respect, um, the fact that you know, going back to the Polish elections, I mean, you know, sort of the Polish elections, in a sense, would enable us, or you know, well, yes, have enabled us to have to at least try to increase slightly the level of ambition on the reform you know conversation mm. i'm not sure that we're really changing tack in this respect yeah i mean it seems to me that the approach that um you know sort of the commission president outlined back in september in her state of the union address is basically kind of the track that we're on rather than, in a sense, for the factoring in that something has happened in Poland that actually would enable you to increase, you know, sort of heighten that bar a little bit. Thank you. Yanis. When it comes to EU reforms, which, by the way, can mean different things, huh? we need to spell out what actually you mean when you talk about EU reform and what the level of ambition should be. Uh, with, my, with my pragmatic hat on, I would tell you we need a certain roadmap. This is what we can do. We need to get a decision before the European Parliament elections in order to make sure that because the, the outcome of the parliament elections won't be positive. So things will be more even difficult more then. So we need to agree on something which we will do um, and be ambitiously pragmatic. Um, but if I put on my realistic hat in the sense of actually what we were discussing earlier, all this is not enough, giving the pressure we on. Uh, but if you look into the debates at the member state level, uh, they are so preoccupied with their own internal concerns of what is happening. The EU dimension is not top of the agenda. No? It's not even point two or three. In our discussions, we are aware of what we need to do at the European level because we are aware that member states alone will not be able to do so. Uh, but in the national debates, my feeling is we're so preoccupied with our internal concerns. Uh, and I give you just one example. You have a huge mess now in Germany because of the budget, uh, because of the constitutional court ruling. What is the first thing or one of the first things you hear with respect to the European level? Don't expect that Germany will be able to provide much more money as a net contributor because we have other problems at home. Okay? That's just anecdotally the level of reaction you get, which is so totally different from actually what we would have to do, given what we were talking about over the past hour. So this discrepancy is huge. And I actually it's extremely difficult to bridge that gap. We are almost that, that's where out. that's where I think Natalie your pessimism comes from. We come back to where we started. We are almost out of time. And I wanted to I'm gonna take on board, Fabian, that when I asked you to say what the, should the priorities be for the next strategic agenda, you rightly said, I can't do that because it's about the coherence across all an action across all policy areas. But nevertheless, Yanis said. We've had so many wake-up calls. His note of optimism at the beginning, and I'd like to return to that if we can, that maybe 
we've had so many wake up calls now that we will actually wake up. Uh, and you talked about the time has come to walk the walk for each of you. And I'll start with you, Fabian. Then I'll go to Yanis and I'd like to give Natalie the last word. Taking on board that I'm not asking you to pick a priority. I'm going to put it a different way. A key next step. EU leaders meet at the summit in December. Uh, they need to, if we are to have any hope of getting on this strategic direction that you've been talking about, having this debate, this big debate that we need to have, what for you is going to be the key next step to getting us on the right track? Uh, Natalie said, nothing is irreversible, but we're coming close to it in some, in the case of the Middle East. Uh, but more broadly, what for you needs to happen at the December summit if we are to genuinely respond to this moment that we face? Fabian first. Um, I'm not being just contrary, um, but I'm not going to answer that one either. Well, you have um, to, because I'm Charles Michel now, and I'm chairing the council, and I want to know well, what it is. I'm being very specific but, now. I'm not asking a question. What but I, at the summit? I mean, the reason why I'm saying that is because whatever I, I say now, I am 100% convinced it's not going to happen. What should because, happen? Because, the well, for, for me, what is important is actually what do we do now? Because uh, if we know that they are not going to do what is necessary, I think what we should collectively do is to start having these strategic discussions and to start putting on the table what we think should happen, to start drafting the strategic agenda as it should look rather than as it's going to look. And I think that is something we can do. Um, it's not going to solve the problems, but at least it will show that there's a different direction we could be going. Um, because the one thing I'm very much convinced of is our leaders are not going to do it. Thank you very much. Yanis. If you want to do, Fabian, what you were saying, what you actually are calling us to do is to tell truth to power. Because many in positions of power actually do not want to hear this. What they would want to hear from you, so the, the question you were posing uh, with respect to what to advise Michel, the question is whether he's the one who you should actually need to advise, um, is that they would want to hear, let's be concrete with respect to the EU reform roadmap, let's take the decisions on enlargement we have to take, uh, let's make sure that we get the budget for until 27 in order. These are the things which are being discussed. Um, so we're not talking about uh, at the December summit at what we were discussing over the past more than one hour. Um, now, you were quoting me on the wake-up call. Mm -hmm. um, I think that when we get to the point, and I do not know what point and at what point and what actually it will be, where we will be, be called to actually take the really tough decisions. I think we will deliver. We will deliver. Uh, but there will be a huge cost or potential cost if we then deliver too late. And this is something which relates to potentially life and death. Yeah. You know, in other occasions of chapters of the permanent crisis, we often were also too, were too late, but that had economic effects. Um, it had effects on, on, on health. Um, now we're talking about something potentially which is much more serious. Huh? So the cost of non-action, as yeah. uh, you were putting it, Natalie, is huge, is at a totally different level. The debate we're having is not at that level. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Natalie, you have the last word. Well, this is really a kind of, well, firstly, I mean, I agree with what Fabian was saying. Uh, and so what I'm about to say contradicts what he was saying, but I'm going to say it because I agree with him. <laughs> Meaning, you know, given uh, that, um, you know, the, 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 that, that meeting will not have the strategic conversation. And I think absolutely what we should be saying is talking about what that strategic conversation should be about. However, if the question then becomes, yes, okay, but fine, what... Given that you know we have who, who we have, you know there's exactly. just a, there's a bunch of people in the room. What is it that they could be discussing, and it can get into their little heads exactly that, <laughs> that actually they should be be discussing. And so that's where the segue from Yanis actually I think comes. Um, I think that it even these people. Um, could be brought to, a, it could be shepherded, you know, to a conversation. So yes, indeed, this may be a point, you know, that Charles Michel could put on the agenda of, 
you know, hey guys, we've got a year from now, there is a, you know, 50-50 chance that we're going to get Trump in the White House. What is it that we can do? We're on a trajectory in which Ukraine will lose this war if we carry on like this. What can we do to step up the game? Because if we wake up when it actually happens, then as we were saying earlier, it's going to be too late. Maybe, maybe, maybe this simple point (laughs) can get into their heads. Maybe. Thank you so much. And thank you for that optimistic, maybe, maybe, maybe. That's as optimistic as we can manage to be today. But it is something. It's a crumb of comfort and I'm going to hold on to it. Natalie, it's been brilliant to have you with us again. Thank you so much for joining us. Fabian Yanis, as always, that is all we have time for. Just wanted to draw your attention to a couple of things, uh, EPC activities that link very much to what we've been talking about. If you haven't had a chance to take a look at the roundup uh, that the EPC analysts have produced reacting to last week's enlargement package from different angles. Do take a look. You'll find it on the website. Uh, And some events linking to the topics we've been discussing. We talked about Poland. We didn't mention the Netherlands, but important elections coming up in the Netherlands. There will be an event next Monday uh, looking, an online event, looking at the results of those elections and what they mean. And an early flag up of the EPC's annual conference on December the 5th. Time for strategy, Europe 2024 to 20. 2029 in a geopolitical world and Fabian Yanis and I will be back on Friday December the 16th immediately after the summit press conferences hoping that they have ended by then uh, with another EPC update date and post summit briefing and we'll see then whether they have in any shape form or size risen to the challenge that you've all set them today thank you so much it's been brilliant come back soon Natalie thank you very much bye-bye everyone